Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the International Institute for Peace and the Sir Peter Ustinov uh, Institute, uh, I want to welcome you here tonight. There are still some places here, so you don't have to stand if you want to sit it's here. There's no special uh, reservation. There's here and there are some chairs outside. You can move around, so please come and take your seat. Um, yeah, I'm very happy that so many people came, um, in spite of the heat wave or the, the summer who suddenly came. Um, Brexit does not suddenly come. It's a long, nearly uh, not ever story, a long story anyway. Um, and we're very happy that Professor Knight uh, is, uh, has been ready to come. Professor Knight is here teaching at the University of Vienna. Uh, the Peter Ustinov Institute has organized uh, him as a guest professor. He's a uh, teaching university, and as I hear from students, he's uh, very well received and uh, well attended by the students. I hope uh, you like it as much as the students like uh, you uh, teaching. Um, and I think we're very happy that he speaks to a subject which, of course, is uh, uh, in spite of recent events in Austria overshadowing uh, the Brexit case, <laughs> is nevertheless, well, uh, the title is Darkest Hour, question mark. Maybe they have also a dark hour, at least some people have a dark hour. A church in myth making and the great Brexit fiasco. Well, of course, Mr. Johnson knows it will not be a fiasco. Mr. Trump knows how to solve the issues easily uh, without having a fiasco. But I think many other people think it could be a fiasco. Anyway, for me as a European and having worked together with many British colleagues, many reasonable British colleagues, <laughs> some unreasonable British colleagues, but many reasonable British colleagues, I'm very uh, sad that it seems to go in the direction of a Brexit. <laughs> but uh, the country, you know, is split and uh, it uh, <laughs> will not, uh, according to my own opinion, will not help if a narrow majority would now turn around and uh, vote for a stay. But anyway, I think the relationship between the European Union and, and uh, the United Kingdom or Great Britain or however you call it, um, will have to be cared for in the coming years. We had a discussion with Ambassador Cristiani, who was also here, was Ambassador to, to, uh, to London for many years. So we have many other people who are very um, knowledgeable and happy they are here. And it will not be the last discussion on uh, Brexit. We will continue in uh, autumn because uh, even with Brexit, the relationship, uh, special relationship between Britain and uh, Europe, the continent will not stop. But we will have to find a way of cooperating, of co-working, of uh, working together on many of the fields. And another ambassador here who is also very knowledgeable about uh, the whole situation. So we will try to get a lot of uh, input also in the coming months in autumn about how we can contribute to a better relationship between European Union and the uh, United Kingdom. But now it's the end. Uh, Maria from our institute uh, will chair the meeting or will moderate the meeting and uh, hand over to you and Professor Knight to teach us about the myth and about what Churchill would have said or would have not said to the situation as Brexit today. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, warm welcome on my side as well. Uh, without further ado, I give the word to Professor Knight. We will speak around 40 minutes and then we will have a question and answer session. Thank you very much for those kind words and thank you for coming here tonight. Um, and I also have to say my thank yous to the uh, Ustinov Institute and the, the whole team. There, to the Institute for Zeitgeschichte, and last not least, of course, to the um, citizens of the city of Vienna um, for supporting my stay here. Um, of course, one of the uh, additional advantages of being at the Peter Ustinov Institute is that you can uh, reach for the great store of 
Peter Ustinov quotes in order to um, find a suitable introduction for your um, talk. And so I've stolen a couple from the list of Ustinov aphorisms to start off with. I found two in particular. The first one, admittedly a bit stereotypical, <clears throat> I imagine hell like this, Italian punctuality, German humor, and English wine. Um, uh, perhaps we need to update this because according to my friends, some English wine is not so bad now. Um, perhaps we could update it to Italian punctuality, German humor, and English political decision making. <laughs> Secondly, a second aphorism from Sir Peter, which I would like to believe in, although sometimes it's hard to, quote, the point of living and of being an optimist is to be foolish enough to believe that the best is yet to come. And of course, that seems not a bad way to start a discussion about the great Brexit fiasco. Uh, the main argument I want to make tonight, in a nutshell, is that, um, an important route to the current fiasco is a particular kind of myth-making about World War II, in which Winston Churchill, and specifically Churchill's role in the crisis of the summer 1940, are central. This was the start of a period of about a year when, according to most accounts, Britain stood alone, in capital letters, against Nazi Germany. In examining the way uh, this myth-making works, I want to focus in particular on one much-discussed scene in the recently enormously successful film Darkest Hour, uh, made in 2017. Directed by Joe Wright and based on screenplay by Anthony McCartan, it follows Winston Churchill in the month after he took over as Prime Minister on the 10th of May 1940. I want to discuss one scene in particular which shows Winston Churchill in the London Underground, allegedly for the first time in his life. Um, to recall the context of this scene, before we see the clip, Winston Churchill, <clears throat> after taking over as Prime Minister, is immediately at the centre of the deepening crisis in the war, with France heading for collapse and British, with French and Belgian troops, retreating towards Dunkirk. At this time of crisis, there is some talk within the Conservative leadership of using Mussolini as a go-between to open negotiations for some kind of deal with Hitler. At this point, as I said, Churchill, for the first time in his life, goes into the underground on advice from George VI to find out what the people really think. Yeah. Um, there, he starts to bond with ordinary Londoners, and here, hopefully, we can Churchill imitation for you. But it's not showing. How are you all preparing up? Because this isn't a new Okay, we can just, we can just turn it all over. Okay. Okay. Good, good spirits. Yes. Uh, just as well, we should read them. Uh, uh, let me ask you something that's been weighing on my mind. Perhaps you can provide me with an answer. You. Uh, the British people, what is your
Storm Moon. Uh, is it, uh, is it confluence? 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 Yeah. How confluence? Very. Some people say it's a lost cause. Well, lost causes is the only ones worth fighting for. Too right. Yes. Now let me ask you this: If the worst came to pass, and and the enemy were to appear on those those streets above, what would you do? Fight. Fight the fascists. Fight them with anything we can lay our hands on. Broom handles if we must. Street by street. They will never take Piccadilly. <laughs> I never said Piccadilly in tears. <laughs> and what if I put it to you all that we might, if we, uh, if we ask nicely, get very favourable terms from Mr. Hitler if we enter into a peace deal with him right now? What would you say to that? Never! 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 sequence. Churchill emerges from the underground, stiffened and resolute, um, gets out of Westminster and proceeds to address the cabinet. Um, he mobilizes the English language, as one of his uh, opponents puts it, and the film closes with his famous Dunkirk speech um, after thanking, giving thanks for the miracle of deliverance of the troops and the beaches, he reaffirms uh, that uh, the British and the British Empire will continue to fight. There will be no, no negotiations and, quote, we will never surrender. Um, this scene, um, which I'm going to discuss and try and unpack in the course of uh, my talk, was widely discussed and has also been criticised, um, even by those who basically loved the film, one commentator was the prominent Brexiteer journalist Charles Moore, a former editor of the Daily Telegraph. He praised the film as, quote, superb Brexit propaganda. Though he conceded that the underground scene was absurd, that did not worry him too much. That seems appropriate enough for a, a former editor of a newspaper which used to belong to Conrad Black, the convicted felon recently pardoned by Donald Trump a newspaper which lost heavily in a much publicized live action. So it's not surprising that factual inaccuracy didn't concern him very much. Regardless of this inaccuracy, he, he argued, the film showed a deeper truth. Quote, that is, it is sometimes both possible and necessary 
if continental Europe is going one way for Britain to go the other, end of quote. I hope tonight to suggest a different way of understanding this film and the scene, and at the same time to explain how Moore's response and similar responses can help us explain how we got into our current mess. I want firstly to go back to the author of the verse quoted in the clip that you've just seen, um, the Victorian writer and politician Thomas Lord Macaulay. Secondly and thirdly, I want to propose two elements for an alternative narrative, if you like an alternative film, based on a less uncritical reading of British imperial history in relation to India and the West Indies. Fourthly and lastly, I want to conclude that as the success of the film itself shows, the complacent self-congratulatory narrative which has permeated British politics um, since the war has led Britain into its current, what I would call, politics of fantasy. Um, so that's my uh, plan, my, uh, my three or four point uh, plan. So I, and I start with uh, Lord Macaulay, the author of the poem. Um, here's a picture. There he is, a very um, impressive, uh, self-confident Victorian f figure, possibly the most famous 19th century British historian and essayist of his time. He was a prominent Whig, i.e. an early liberal, a reforming politician who spoke out powerfully in the House of Commons for the ending of penalties for Catholics and Jews. And in 1832, supported, um, again very eloquently, the reform of Parliament. As his five-volume History of England showed, his basic story was of a triumph of, Brit of English, rather than British, enlightened reform and successful resistance to absolute, absolutist despotism. At its centre was the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688-9, to the expulsion of the last Catholic King of England, James II. Um, at the same time, this glorious story was also due to Britain's successful avoidance of the perils of mob rule. Their destructive power for Macaulay had emerged in France after the revolution and was still seen in England in the 1840s in the de demands of the Chartists, overnight socialists and such like to broaden the franchise to give the vote to working people and introduce other parliamentary reforms. Macaulay, in short, presented his readers with unmatched self-confidence and panache with a pageant of progress achieved through the stirring deeds of great English men. All those three words with capital letters. Um, as the British historian Catherine Hall has argued, Macaulay's worldview was universalist in principle, but his, this universalism was constantly undercut by the narrowness of his empathy. She points to a wider reality that in the, what she calls the liberal imperialist state, quote, exclusion and equality were wedded together. And those excluded by Macaulay, because they were deemed unfit or inferior, included the victims of the Irish famine in the 1840s, and perhaps most notoriously Indians, who Macaulay came into contact with during his brief stay in India between 1834 and 1837, when he was legal member of the Governor General's Council. At a time, I should add, that India was not yet um, uh, in integrated into the British Empire, it was still ruled by the um, uh, East India Company. As legal member, he pursued the anglicizing, if you like, Europeanizing agenda of the Governor General with great energy, and in two areas in particular, language education and legal reform. His famous Minute on Education of 1835 uh, in support of English language um, education had a deep and lasting effect. He called for the end of subsidies for Sanskrit and Persian medium college education and the, the transfer of the subsidy to English language. But it was the tone and the rhetoric of his proposal which has caused as much offence as the proposal itself and continues to cause uh, 
offence, bolstered by his unshakable belief in European cultural superiority, resting on his deep knowledge of the Greek and Roman classics, and completely undeterred by his equally deep ignorance of any English Indian language, Macaulay declared in his, a very famous sentence that, quote, a single shelf of a good European library is worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia, end of quote. Um, rather than anglicizing the whole population of India, uh, an elite would need to be trained, which Macaulay described as, another famous quote, a class which may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons Indian in blood and colour, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect, end of quote. Um, admittedly, as his defenders point, uh, point out, and he has uh, a few, plenty of defenders within uh, India, in the Indian discussion, uh, Macaulay did not completely rule out Indian self-government and didn't use explicitly racial arguments, but clearly any self-government would lie in a very distant future. The minute an education only became famous or notorious after Macaulay's death continues to resonate in the subcontinent where Macaulayism and the so-called children of Macaulay are still used as terms of abuse now in particular from the Hindu nationalist side, but also more used positively by advocates of the Dalit caste, so-called untouchables. Um, and um, an even more recent striking example was the letter of justification, in inverted commas, for the attempted, the Taliban attempted assassination of uh, Malala Yousafzai, who, which actually referred to, quote, Sir T.B. Macaulay, and the sort of anglicizing agenda as part of the justification for um, trying to assassinate uh, Malala in, in Pakistan. In his lifetime, however, Macaulay was famous for his writing, published after his return to England. Apart from the history, um, it, the lay, it was the lays of in, ancient Rome, the poems of which Horatius, we just heard uh, an extract from, which were the foundations of his fame and fortune. They made him so famous, you could call him the kind of John Grisham of his day. Um, maybe a bit unfair, possibly unfair to John Grisham. But um, at any rate, uh, the parallels between um, his story of Roman Republican valor and English national imperial mission are clear to see. To brief, summarize very briefly the Horatius story, after Horatius volunteers, as in the, part the verse already quoted, volunteers to hold off the advancing Etruscan forces at the gates of Rome. With his two comrades, he fights on the outer bank of the Tiber to give the Romans enough time to destroy the bridge uh, behind him. His companions get back in time, but Horatius is left alone, apparently facing inevitable death. But then he entrusts his fate to Father Tiber and jumps into the river in full armor. Against all the odds, he survives. The river takes him safely to the opposite bank, where he's greeted by the Senate and later heaped with honors. Should be able to have a. There's a, a, a late Victorian depiction of the scene. I should stress this is not an allegory of the uh, Brexit negotiations. <laughs> this is Macaulay having reached the other side. Um, now I turn to, first to the Indian connection to Churchill and then to the West Indian connection. Churchill has often been described as a late Victorian imperialist and it's not hard to point out some features which he shared with the early Victorian Macaulay. Boundless self-confidence, optimism, and above all, an unshakable belief in the superiority of British institutions, which is often called the Whig version of history, centered around the glorious revolution of 1688-9, which in Churchill's case was also a family history, so since, since his ancestor John Churchill, uh, the first Duke of Marlborough, was also involved in the events. Yet, as Richard Toy argues, um, contrary to a facile historicist, historicist argument, that he can only be judged in the context of his time, there were plenty of alternative views available. Churchill's later opinions were not the inevitable product of his Victorian upbringing per se. 
Um, of course, it's no secret that Churchill was an imperialist um, who famously believed uh, or declared that he had not become prime minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. That's what he said in 90, November 1942. As a young man, he served at several British imperial outposts from the northwest from the northwest frontier to East and South Africa during the Boer War. In his recent biography of Churchill, uh, Andrew Roberts calls Churchill's love of empire a secular religion. Um, he stresses the supposed altruism of his motives. Um, uh, the great work that England was doing, this is in um, uh, Churchill's view as understood by Roberts, and of her high mission to rule these primitive but agreeable races for their, for their welfare and for our own. The question asked at this point, often asked, is was Churchill also a racist? In one sense, the answer is straightforward. Of course he was, in the same unthinking way that most of his upper-class English contemporaries were. Yet we also need to be cautious of an oversimplification. Churchill had not, did not have explicit racist, racist ideas on the lines of the influential thinkers of his day, like Gobineau or Houston Chamberlain, or their English followers, of whom there were several. Richard Toy has often uh, aptly sums up the tension of his position, quote, the British capacity for racial tolerance for Churchill was a fundamental part of British racial superiority, end of quote. Uh, in fact, as Toy also shows, Churchill's attitudes shifted throughout his long career and were often hard to predict. I won't go into some of the examples now. But perhaps the heaviest charge of racism against Churchill is in relation to India. His opposition, indeed his hatred of Mahatma Gandhi and the Congress Party and the campaign for <coughs> Indian independence, or rather home rule, reflected a contempt for Indians as a whole, especially Hindu Indians. We called on one occasion, quote, a, a beastly people with a beastly religion. In this sense too, we could call Churchill a child of Macaulay. His derogatory comments about Gandhi are too well known to be repeated here. <coughs> what is important is that his dismissive, contemptuous attitude arguably led him to ignore repeated warnings in 1942 and 1943 about the gravity of the imminent famine in Bengal and the resulting delays in diverting train, grain transport contributed to the unnecessary death of certainly over a million, possibly as many as two million people. <clears throat> the heated debate about Churchill's responsibility for this uh, continues to rumble on. Most recently, Andrew Roberts has been concerned to reject the charge of genocide, but this is surely an Aunt Sally. Um, the point here is not whether or not Churchill deliberately aimed at genocide, which he clearly uh, didn't. Um, but that through uh, negligence or lack of interest, he allowed a mass famine to take place. To quote the famous lines of the, another Victorian poem, Arthur Clough, Churchill, quote, did not strive officiously to keep alive. I don't know if you, you know the, uh, the, the poem. It's called a sort of alternative Ten Commandments by Arthur Clough. It's called the, the, the latest decalogue. Um, uh, a very biting satire. I could tr I've tried to translate it into German as um, it's the Gebot you should not kill. Du, soll, du solltest nicht töten, muss aber dich aber nicht bemühen, eifrig am Leben zu halten. <laughs> so to sagen, meine Übersetzung. Um, and in this respect too, I, don't, I think we could say Churchill's attitude doesn't differ that much from Macaulay's attitude towards the victims of the Irish famine a century uh, uh, before. I turn secondly to the second imperial strand, the West Indies, of course the homeland of uh, the uh, West Indian fellow traveller in the underground, Marcus Peters, as his fictional name. Macaulay came from a strongly abolitionist evangelical Christian family. His father, Zachary, had been a leading light in the campaign to abolish um, slavery and then abolish first the slave trade and later slavery itself in nearly all British colonies. 
Um, his son Macaulay, you could say, naturally voted for the abolition of slavery in 1833. But he did not share his father's commitment or his father's religious zeal. When it came to the abolitionist cause in the United States, and of course, um, just before the um, American Civil War, he was contemptuous and um, uh, derisive, really. In, in response to the great success of Uncle Tom's Cabin, he wrote to his sister, a quote, although he hated slavery from the bottom of his soul, he was also, quote, made sick by the cant, i.e. the hypocrisy, and the silly mock reasons of the abolitionists. The nigger driver, i.e. the slave, uh, slave uh, uh, driver, slave owner, and the negrophile, are two odious things to me. So he equates the two, the slave owner and the slave and the abolitionist, um, as equally um, objectionable. He also spoke of, quote, the gibberish of the Negroes of Jamaica, end of quote. Presumably that gibberish would also have been spoken by one of the ancestors of the fictional Marcus Peters, whom we've seen in the film. In the century which followed emancipation, the West Indies were, at least as seen from Westminster, a fairly marginal and much neglected part of the British Empire. Only after the unemployment and deprivation reached breaking point and led to outbreaks of unrest and rioting in the 1930s did the British respond, sort of respond. The government instigated a royal commission chaired by Lord Moyne, and by an interesting coincidence, Churchill's, uh, Lord Moyer, I should say, was a family friend of the Churchills. Churchill's wife, Clementine, briefly came across the commission early in, at the end of, 19, sorry, at the end of 1938, she joined the cruise ship in a private capacity. Uh, Lord Moyne's, uh, Lord Moyne, of course, was a millionaire, one of the Guinness family, then touring the Caribbean. We know that she was shocked by the contrast between the beauty of the country and the wretched living conditions of the inhabitants because she wrote to her husband about it. Perhaps we should not expect, it would be too much to expect, McCartan's fictional Churchill to ask his equally fictional Marcus Peters why he had left the West Indies to come to London. But we can surely speculate about Jim Churchill's likely response to meeting Marcus Peters in the underground. It would surely, first of all, be simple amazement. After all, to make a very obvious point, there were very few West Indians in London in 1940. Only a few hundred were working in the London docks, and there were a few more working in Liverpool. Secondly, a Victorian labourer citing Macaulay would have been unusual, to put it mildly. In his review of Darkest Hour, the head of the idolatrous Churchill project in the United States at Hillsdale College, Richard Langdale, claimed that, quote, Macaulay's verses were part of an education which British subjects of all stations once received, my emphasis. That makes the British Empire appear much more egalitarian than it ever was. And it seems to me an attempt to make the implausible Marcus Peters a much more plausible character. On either count, it's very far-fetched. What is true is that Macaulay's poems became standard fodder for several generations of English public school boys in Britain and in the empire. And they included the young Winston Churchill. And we know that Churchill memorized, apparently memorized a thousand verses of this poem at Harrow School. But the West Indian education system uh, was uh, entirely based on a Eurocentric syllabus organized from Cambridge, but it was also highly selective in the way which reflected the social and racial hierarchy of the islands, sometimes called a pigmentocracy. Very few black West Indians managed to get through to secondary education at all. Even fewer went to university in England with one of the coveted scholarships to Oxford University. Two well-known exceptions which proved the rule were the Trotskyite intellectual C.L.R. James and the Marxist historian and later Prime Minister of Trinidad, Eric Williams. I think we can safely assume that Marcus Peters did not share either of their views. 
Um, for example, James Trench in view of Macaulay as one of those historians alongside Tacitus, Thucydides and Green who, quote, wrote so well because they saw so little, end of quote. <laughs> or Eric Williams' famous work, Slavery and Capitalism, admittedly had not yet been published in 1940, but it's surely relevant in this po at this point to read Eric Williams's recollections of his grammar school education which led on to his study of, of, uh, at Oxford. Um, Greek and Latin were very much at the central, center of it, much more than any history of the West Indians. As Williams put it, at school they had learned the Latin dictum, the plantation, comed the plantation economy ruined Italy, but had not the slightest idea of how the plantation economy had ruined the West Indies and was even then ruining Trinidad, end of quote. Fans of Pliny the Elder amongst you will no doubt have recognized the translation of Latifundia Pedideri Italiam. Um, I have to confess I had to look that up Wikipedia. Um, as I said, Marcus Peter, the fictional West Indian, is unlikely to have shared any of these, this skepticism. This fantasy creation is also clearly blissfully aware of any racist animosity amongst his fellow uh, tube passengers. Marcus Peters in the film is portrayed as a kind of early example of the Windrush generation of immigrants who came to the United Kingdom after the war, full of optimism and hope. But Marcus McCartin's film was made um, in 2017, long after these hopes had been undermined by the realities of everyday racism and discrimination. So I think there's no excuse for it. I turn finally then to the great Brexit fiasco along these two uh, imperial or imperialist routes to arrive at the current fiasco. My argument is that the fantasy planet which much of the British political class appears to inhabit has been fostered by a mythology about the Second World War. Films like The Darkest Hour are equally responsible for this as are the mendacious press reporting like the Daily Mail, especially under the recent editorship of the unlamented editor Paul Badeka and the Daily Telegraph once owned by Conrad Black and edited by Charles Moore. Um, I'd distinguish at least three main elements to this mythology. Firstly, the delusion that um, through the application of belief or optimism or willpower, you can overcome rational calculation. Horatius defied the rational odds and survived. So, it is claimed, wrongly claimed, did Britain under Churchill in 1940. It is only a, one, a small step to the assertion that all we need to do is, quote, believe in Britain, end quote. And skeptics and rational arguments are then condemned as, quote, talking Britain down. Secondly, there is the delusion that there is no need to worry about the damage that our actions do. In the end, the foreigners will come round. They won't hold it against us. There won't be any hard feelings. Horatius so impressed the Etruscan enemies by his courage that, quote, even the ranks of Tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer, end of quote, after he jumped into the river. And in this respect, the British Empire was essentially an altruistic project. Um, India and the other former colonies will be happy to conclude beneficial tra trade deals with us. We obstructed European member states, got special deals and opt-outs from our fellow EU members, and generally acted as the awkward partner for 30 years, and then as awkward Brexit negotiators for another three. But we still allegedly have a fund of goodwill which we can tap when we move into trade negotiations. Thirdly, there is the delusion of national harmony centered on the mythology of Westminster as the mother of parliament. Here, since 2016, we have seen the disaster of trying to graft plebiscitary decision makings onto a majoritarian representational major uh, democracy. Even before the referendum was held, the British electoral system was essentially broke or unfit for purpose. It eff effectively defranchised, disenfranchised a large section of the electorate. And here I explicitly <coughs> include UKIP voters as well as voters of the Green Party 
and the Liberals. And I think that explains some of the um, momentum and the resentment that is now being expressed. But since the referendum, uh, the absence of a plebiscitary po political culture like that of Switzerland has become all too clear. It has allowed the, a 52-48 uh, outcome of a 75% turnout, i.e. 37% vote of the uh, electoral roll, to be interpreted as the decision of the nation, but in fact as rather as a majority vote in a parliamentary constituency used to be interpreted, is interpreted, i.e. with the triumphalism of the so-called winner-take-all system and the expectation that the losing side should either rally round or shut up. As the difficulties have emerged, the initial triumphalism gave way or was supplemented to the search for saboteurs and traitors, a word which trips easily off the pen of the journalists of the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph and of Brexit politicians and other commentators. The Brexit euphoria of 2016 <coughs> has given momentum and self-confidence to a nasty extremist fringe inside and outside the Conservative Party. This can have fatal consequences as we saw with the shocking murder of the Labour MP Joe Cox in June 2016. Underpinning all these three delusions is a smug self-satisfaction about Britain, which stems from the mythology that I've tried to analyze tonight. Implicitly or explicitly, it rests, rests on the notion that Britain not only stood alone between May and 1940 and April 1941, which is at least debatable, but that it won the war in spite of Europe or even against the rest of Europe. Translate this mistake and this myth mythology into the completely different context of international negotiations and you get, for example, the Daily Express hailing Theresa May on her return from the Salzburg summit in September 2018 with the words, or with the headline, her finest hour <laughs> in a war, quote, with a war with the EU. I could give you some other examples, but I'll, I'll skip them now. At this point, I would like to come back to Darkest Hour for the last time in order to suggest an alternative underground meeting, a scene which might have produced a smaller box office, especially in the United States, I should say, but would have been more truthful. In it, Winston Churchill could have met one of those thousands of foreigners who really were travelling in the London underground in May 1940. Refugees, Jewish and non-Jewish, from Germany, Austria, Poland and Czechoslovakia and elsewhere. Perhaps he could even have bonded with one of those re recently arrived Polish or Czech pilots who in only a matter of weeks would be risking their lives in the Battle of Britain. But that kind of encounter would of course have had one major drawback for Charles Moore and Widdicombe and their like. It could easily have led audiences to believe that Britain had been fighting a war not against Europe, but against Nazi Germany and alongside European refugees. In conclusion, let, let me make it clear that I am not denying Winston Churchill that Winston Churchill was a great war leader of great abilities. That is stating the obvious. You don't need to accept the concept of destiny or see Churchill as someone who, in the title of Adam Roberts' biography, was walking with deputy, was walking with destiny to accept that point. But, it, and it was clearly extremely fortunate that Churchill was available at that time and at that place to lead Britain at, the, at this uh, supreme time of crisis. However, the British and the British political classes and British journalists have been feeding off the crisis summer of 1940 for far too long, both politically and morally. For two post-war generations, they have used it to foster a smug and self-deluded mythology about British parliamentary institutions, British democracy and British moral superiority. If the events of the past three years have shown us only one thing, it is that this particular cupboard is bare. Thank you for your attention.
very insightful talk. Fortunately, not very optimistic one, but uh, maybe we will get some more um, forward-looking questions from the audience. And with this, I would like to open the floor for your questions. Please, if possible, ask just one question and state it as briefly as possible. We will collect a round of three, and then we will go to the next round. One question over here. Uh, Melanie? I don't have a perspective on the United Kingdom, but it's a little bit like the United Kingdom is a little bit like the uh, Habsburg Empire. It's a multinational state. I come from Scotland. Scotland voted 62% remain, uh, and the political landscape is completely, uh, is completely different. Do you think that the uh, present be press, uh, Brexit fiasco uh, is likely uh, to lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom? I should add that uh, I also think that we are not, the British are not aware of their awful colonial history in Ireland and that Brexit and the Good Friday Agreement are simply incompatible. For that reason alone, Brexit must be stopped. Another question maybe? Yeah, um, I mean, I... You know, I'm, I'm actually not an expert on Brexit. I'm certainly not a prophet uh, about Brexit uh, or about the or, a, or about Scottish politics. So I hesitate to um, uh, comment on that. I mean, I would understand it if uh, Brexit uh, on on the on the lines that some people want to implement it. If Brexit did lead to um, a stronger demand for. Uh, uh, a second referendum and and that led to Scottish uh, uh, majority for independence at the moment it doesn't seem that it's doing that in Scotland um, uh, you know we, we'll see uh, as far as the Northern Ireland or the Ireland point goes I I completely uh, agree with you and I think the way that Brexiteer politicians uh, refer to Irish or dismiss the issue of the backstop is actually um, symptomatic of a kind of cavalier sort of British imperial legacy actually um, uh, they dismiss it they call it uh, I think Johnson called it the tail wagging the dog <laughs> completely uh, peripheral issue um, only someone uh, who had never really been concerned with uh, Irish politics and Irish history would be ca capable um, of saying that um, in that respect, maybe uh, Johnson, who, you know, I wouldn't even call an epigon of Churchill, but a, a sort of very cheap uh, wannabe Churchill. Uh, but in that respect, he might have something uh, in, in common with, with Churchill. Um, uh, possibly uh, Macaulay as well, uh, for that matter. Um, basically, the, the British Conservatives although it's called the Conservative Unionist Party, are not interested in Northern Ireland at all, except when the parli parliamentary arithmetic uh, means that they're dependent on a small segment of Northern Irish political opinion, i.e. the Democratic Unionists. And to hear the um, Brexiteers waxing sentimental about the, the Union and um, to hear the, uh, uh, the Unionists talking about you know, the, the sacred union of the last, uh, uh, that we've maintained for the last 40 or 50 years, as if Northern Ireland was not a deeply divided um, society which had been, you know, ruled by um, a unionist majority. To ignore that is, is just, um, well, par for the course, typical, you could say. So, yeah. Do you think that there should be a second referendum on Brexit and do you think there will be a second referendum? Um, yes and no. Okay, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think people are usually more prejudiced than we like to think, so yeah, good input from you in this respect in terms of some well more rational reasons for Brexit. Um, 
I, I should say that I've been, been following many uh, pro carbon labor people on Twitter, I was doing some research, and I came across some articles from back in 2016 or 2017 who established a very close link between pre Brexit and tax evasion for the rich and powerful. So I think that's one of the main rational reasons along with let's say deregulation in order to set off the NHS to US capitalists and, and something like that or opening certain markets and, and yeah, but creating a crisis from which well, capitalists can profit. So I think those would be some rational reasons for why certain elements want Brexit to happen. So maybe you could comment on that. Um, well, going back to the first question, um, yes, I think there should be a second referendum, whatever you want to call it. Um, because the uh, momentum behind the Brexit position and the, the sheer sort of aggression and um, anger and uh, the preemptive talk of treachery and treason and almost the expectation, almost the hope that uh, there will, the, the so-called treason will happen. I think the only way to slightly reduce that, slightly counteract that in the long term is by some kind of counter expression of, of I feel like, plebiscitary um, democracy. Um, uh, it won't remove the accusation of betrayal and treason, but it might, it might deflect it or might um, lessen it. So, in that sense, yes, I, I am in favour. I'm not in favour of, you know, MPs deciding to overrule the the results of the of the first referendum. I'm, I'm in favour. Well, some people call it a confirmatory uh, referendum. Um, it, it may be that some kind of, you know, that some form of Brexit. It probably is inevitable. Now, but but uh, but there are many different possibilities. Um, I think, and then, you know, in ten or twenty years, well, who, who knows what uh, might uh, happen. Um, at the moment, it doesn't seem as if it's that likely because of the position of the Labour Party, in particular, Jeremy Corbyn. However, the way the uh, well, the recent vote went, and the way that the you know, the, the, the Remain side uh, seems to be deserting Labour and going to the Lib Dems or possibly the Greens. Um, with our broken parliamentary system, you might possibly even get a, a favourable um, outcome if, if the arithmetic turns. I mean, you know, I'm happy to say that uh, as a long life uh, Labour voter, if the arithmetic looked um, plausible in the area where I have a vote, for getting a lib Liberal or Lib Dem uh, Member of Parliament on a Remain or a second referendum agenda, I would certainly vote Lib Dem. So I belong to that part of the Labour support which is drifting away. Um, as the other, in that direction, as the, as the other question, question pointed out or suggested, there is also an element in the Labour Party which uh, is um, for Brexit in one form or another, um, Jeremy Corbyn clearly um, is in favour of some form of uh, Brexit, um, and as you said, you said there are rational arguments for Brexit. But when you mentioned tax evasion and, and a kind of low tax economy, I thought we were talking about rational arguments against Brexit, mm -hmm. because the vision of Brexit that people on the certainly on the Conservative side have, Rhys Mogg and so on, is. Um, you know, a model of so-called open Britain, uh, low tax economy, you know, support a sort of neoliberal paradise, open to um, American competition. Or, you know, at this point, of course, the, the, the sentimental argument of 1940 or the wartime alliance kicks in, and and another delusion which I haven't talked about, which is that. Not on the basis of a special relationship, some kind of sentimentality, but you know, American pharmaceuticals and the American agro uh, industry is somehow going to give British consumers um, a better deal than the market would allow them. To, you know, an another delusion that I haven't talked about. I mean, there are, of course, there are rational arguments for Brexit. Um, one that I have actually discussed with. Um, a colleague at the university where I am, or where I was, 
is about wage levels uh, in some parts of, for example, the agricultural sector, um, and the way uh, cheap labour has been exploited by some some uh, industry, unskilled cheap labour. Um, it's quite difficult to find um, a pro-Brexit um, colleague in the university sector, actually. There aren't very many of them. But his argument is, if you like, a, an old, you could call it an old labour, trade unionist position, which says that um, you know, that's what Brexit um, uh, will allow the British system to stop. You know, we're, we're un wage undercutting. I think that's probably over-optimistic. You know, I'm not uncritical about the EU. I should, I should make that clear. I have plenty, plenty of criticisms about the EU, but um, maybe now's not the, not the place to go into that. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the weaknesses and the failings, especially in terms of sort of accounting practices, have allowed the um, Brexiteers to sort of gain their momentum um, and to exploit the situation. That's how I would see it. There's a question over here and another one. Uh, so, thank you very much for a very uh, inspiring talk, and uh, especially about your remarks of the mindset of these, let's say, the Eton boys uh, since the 19th century, practically. As a historian of the Pacific War, uh, I wonder whether we might also suggest to draw a line between the war in Europe and uh, the Pacific War, uh, which added to this very British mindset of we don't need the others, uh, they might come round uh, anyway. So I'm just wondering what you think. Um, Maybe another question. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Since, uh, since Trump is in London right now and it's starting to do all sorts of mischiefs there, probably expectedly so, I'd like to talk for a moment about the fallacy of the notion of a special relationship between Britain and the United States. I think we all do remember at the time of the uh, <coughs> Kuwait war and, and the others, when we called uh, the relationship between Tony Blair, who certainly, who certainly was a, a a convinced pro-European. Um, the fallacy uh, at the time of the, the close relationship between Tony Blair and Bush, when Tony Blair really thought, being so close to Bush that he could sort of uh, reap some sort of, of, of good arguments or see with some advantages uh, for Europe, it, which was not true. I mean, the best thing to Tony Blair could happen at the time that he was invited to the range of Bush in, in, in Texas, which was a, a fantastic treat. Now, uh, Trump, you know, we, we do remember two years ago, when after the referendum, Trump was the first one, or I mean, a little bit later, was the first one to say, okay, don't worry, uh, I think we immediately replace your, your trade relationship with the United, <coughs> sorry, with the European Union with mine. Uh, my argument is, I mean, he has repeated that today, but my argument is it won't happen. I mean, we all know that the trade, trade relationships between Britain, it's about 15 or 18 percent with the European Union, is so close that neither uh, a, 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 an arrangement with Canada or with, let alone with Switzerland or with Norway it could, could, uh, could replace them. Or for that matter, with Singapore or the or the common words, etc. So I think beware, beware, I can only say, be, Britain beware of, of uh, believing uh, Donald Trump. Thank you. Maybe, maybe also in addition to this last question, uh, I would like to um, also shortly describe there is another scene in this movie where Churchill calls the American president and asks for, uh, asks for his help, but in the end he uh, gets refused. And uh, how would you interpret it? Is it just, uh, you know, uh, reference to some historical events or the movie producers also wanted to say something about it with relation with the United States? <coughs> well, um, oh, I'll go through the questions in order. Um, yeah, I think you were saying that the Pacific War, in terms of the British consciousness, is still a, a forgotten war, and of course that's that's a complaint that uh, we often used to hear from former vet veterans of the, the war, British veterans, 
in, in the Far East. Um, we also heard it about the Korean War with veterans in the Korean War who talked about the, <clears throat> the Forgotten War. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, having taught this semester, well, covering a lot of ground, including you know, the British Empire and the and the Opium War and gunboat uh, diplomacy, uh, uh, I think it's uh, I've kind of become aware of just how forgotten these episodes of British imperialism are in the British uh, consciousness. Um, and they only uh, em emerge maybe when there's some kind of um, diplomatic meeting or encounter and so on and so forth. So that whole legacy, um, the, sort of the humiliation of uh, the Chinese imperial state, that's all completely forgotten. Um, in, in the, as far as India goes, yeah, the British like to, and I think Churchill in his memoirs once oh. recalled the, the number of Indians who volunteered for the Second World War to fight for the British. Of course, they don't tell the other side about how you know, Indian was brought into the war without any um, consultation whatsoever and the kind of uh, 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 suppression of the Indian nationalist movement that carried on in parallel to the war effort and in the name of the war effort and of course all the financial um, implications. So yeah, you know, I think that's correct. Um, the special relationship yeah, well, Tony Blair, as you said, was both um, very close, or tried to be very close with the American government and, you know, and went to the ranch and wore jeans in public and, um, and at the same time was a, a declared you know, Europhile and, and a supporter of the European Union. So one of the many contradictions of of Tony Blair, uh, I guess you could say. Um, um, and of course, uh, one of the documents that has come out uh, from his time in office is this informal note or telegram that he wrote assuring uh, President Bush of his support in the Iraq venture. Um, I think the phrase was, whatever, or we will be with you, whatever you decide, or wherever you go, or words to that effect. Um, uh, it's funny to talk about or to remember President uh, Bush almost uh, warmly and with nostalgia. I think there must be a reason for that. Um, yes, Trump, Trump the great deal maker, as people used to say in the first few months, including some of the t conservative t candidates for the leadership praising up. Donald Trump as the deal maker. Of course, we know how he now a little bit about how he made his deals with the help of the Deutsche Bank and uh, and his lawyers. And sorry, I just have to put this in because there's another of my discoveries from my preparing my lectures that the the young Donald Trump as a an up and coming real estate uh, dealer in New York was given close advice by um, Roy Cohn who was the right-hand man of Senator Joe McCarthy Ooh. in the 1950s, shortly before Cohen's death. There's a, there's a nice little photo you can find of the two of them together. Sorry, that's um, if I, slightly off the point. Um, beware of Trump, yeah, absolutely. Um, as far as the film goes, I, I, I think, and, I, and I've only seen the actual film once, I've seen this film a few, the scene a few times. As far as I remember, Churchill is desperately trying to get support from Roosevelt, which Roosevelt is reluctant to do because it may get him into political trouble in terms of American neutrality and the great opposition there was in, in the States in at that point in getting um, in, in the Americans uh, uh, abandoning their stance of neutrality. And of course, Roosevelt probably did, in the end, go as far as, far as he could. Um, I don't know about the, the realism of, of the film or that exchange. Um, but of course, the support that America did actually give informally or under the table is actually another argument why Britain wasn't actually standing alone between 1940 and 1941, apart from the supplies and the support from the Empire or the Commonwealth and the under the table support of the United States. Without that, you know, Britain would not have survived. Um, 
that also goes, goes against the, you know, the myth-making of, of the Brexiteers. So there was a question over here and at the <coughs> back completely, and also one gentleman. No, no, no. Uh, over there, over there. Uh, Third, fourth row. Sorry. You have mentioned there are a serious problem of direct democracy of a referenda if they are about a very important political decision. If 52% of the British vote for Brexit, but only 75% participated in the turnout, it means that only 35% to 40% of all British have voted for Brexit. So it certainly would be advisable for such an important decision to introduce some thresholds. Say only if 60% or two thirds of the citizens agree, then it is valid. Maybe you could make it even more stronger, like in Switzerland, that also the majority of the political subunits must be created cantons or England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. <laughs> now, <laughs> I see to introduce such a rule before the next press, it is hardly imaginable. Yeah. Everybody for the Brexit would say, yeah. then it's impossible. Yeah. Then we get no majority. But if you do not introduce the Brexit, and even if there is now 52% for remaining in the European, it might also not solve any really problem because the mass might go on and the Brexit deals might make yeah. their huge propaganda yeah. continue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I complete, completely agree with you. Um, and that's what I meant by not, Britain not having a plebiscitary polit political culture um, like in Switzerland. Uh, I'm not sure of the details of the Swiss system, but. Uh, um, Yes, you can't change the rules um, at this point, clearly, but you can't have another referendum on, on different rules, uh, but uh, another referendum, as you say, on the same rules, um, you know, might be in, come out in favour of Remain, but it might be um, equally indecisive, or there might be a lower turnout, for example. Um, I think at this point, all I can say are two words, David Cameron. <laughs> I rest my case. Okay, there was a question completely at the back from the gentleman standing near the pole. Yeah. Okay, one here, one there. Um, you reference these. Uh, you reference these Daily Mail articles uh, with Theresa May fighting her best battle against the EU. Um, and while you were talking, I was flicking through. Carl Schmitt's concept of the political, um, because of course the EU uh, and the Brexit debate was sort of couched on these idea of divisions. Um, Schmitt characterises these things as ghost-like abstractions, and although it's um, nice to hear your opinions on Brexit and, and going forward, I think what um, would be more helpful is to see how it is that we can counter this, uh, these rhetorical devices that um, the Brexit Party, UKIP, as well as just the sort of um, selective historiography um, of British imperialism uses. How do we, how do we negate these ghost-like abstractions that mm. uh, Euroscepticism, as well as just nationalism and populism, is, is couched on? Um, yeah. Okay. I'm thinking about culture. Graciously, my uh, question is related to that. But um, could you comment on the uniqueness of the misplaced um, beliefs of racial superiority in Westminster and in Europe, and potentially um, suggest how we can ensure that those uh, erroneous beliefs are safely consigned to history? And then we have a question from Gabi. Hello. 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 My question would be on the colonial history. Um, you, you spoke about the influence of uh, on the colonial history, 
how is colonial history taught in schools? How broad is this influence? You know that in France there was a debate about, there was a sentence introduced at the time of Sarkozy, there are also the positive elements of, of colonialism. It was deleted <coughs> after that uh, on the President Hollande. How is it in Britain? Because how is it influencing everyday uh, normal people, huh? not only the, the, those who are fighting for, for Brexit, but normal people has an influence on normal people's decision uh, because they have instilled in their mind this empire as an alternative, even if it's not colonial, as an alternative to European. And the last question over here. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Many thanks for your background giving what happened in the past. My question is, what happened now? Maybe I'm wrong, uh, I got it wrong during my studies in, in Britain, when I learned that there is an unwritten constitution. I am a lawyer, are you a lawyer too? Just a question. I'm um, no, afraid not, uh, I'm a historian. Now, the question is that, according to my knowledge, is that the British constitution is not a Britain constitution, but there is a situation given in the history when the future of the country, the future of the empire should be decided, and in that situation the people has to be asked, which way should we go? This is what I learned. Now it got, I think so it is the first or the second time in this last centuries that the people has been asked and is this a referendum which is binding to who? No, no, no. It is a question, it is a constitutional question because I'm missing the voice of the Queen, for example. Uh, yes, uh, excuse me please. Now, <laughs> And what I'm missing is from the newspapers, uh, uh, the wording of the question was given to the people. Do you give, could you give me please the wording? What we should do? Should we join the EU? Should we exit? Should we Brexit? What should we do? And the most important is, did the people uh, uh, ask when they entered to so the uh, so-called economic union, you, you know, uh, uh, union 30 years, years ago. Thank you. Which, is, according to my opinion, this is the most important question. And uh, we never got that answer from England. Not even from Europe. Thank you. Right, okay. So, shall I go through these in order? Um, I'm not sure about Carl Schmidt, uh, but I can appreciate the phrase ghost-like opinions uh, and that they're very difficult to counter. <clears throat> I think the Brexit campaign was very uh, clever in the way it misled people and in terms of its uh, slogan, the slogan uh, take back control was very clever because um, it packed in a lot of assumptions about sovereignty and, and emotion and you know, identity and homeland in a, in a kind of clever way. And then the way that the um, r Remain position was uh, made to look uh, worthless afterwards was, was also quite clever. I think, you know, the so-called Remoners, people who are moaning, they don't like the result. And just because they're bad losers, you know, as if this was some kind of minor parliamentary election where you, you know, you can change it in four or five years anyway, you know, in a, an ordinary constituency in the British system, you know. Oh, they're just moaning, oh, they, they're bad losers, and, you know, which is a very, of course, a complete trivialisation, but a very effective one, actually. Um, so I certainly, you know, I agree that, that you know, and I have to confess, I, I would not or did not go out onto the street to, in favour of uh, Remain, uh, as I didn't campaign partly because it didn't it didn't seem likely to be uh, defeated, but also because it, it, you know the the EU is is a difficult um, issue to um, sort of in, invest emotionally into 
least from where I'm um, sitting. Um, also, though, can, I'm, can, I'm, I'm coming to you. Um, the second point about consigning, I think you were saying consigning the belief of British racial superiority to, to history. Well, you know, one can only hope and keep on trying and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, that's certainly a, a, a very long, long term and, uh, as you say, fairly remote prospect. And yet, if you look back at what the kind of things that were said or were done 30 or 40 years ago, then you could argue that some things have changed and some things have even, um, you know, improved um, as far. Uh, the, the kind of a, <clears throat> the Nigel Farage um, segment of the population, I actually think, is no higher than, should we say, 34, well, maximum 40%. Uh, well, that's bad enough, okay? But I don't think it's a kind of majority position. <clears throat> but I am convinced, on the basis of no empirical research whatsoever, I'm convinced that a significant part of the Brexit um, vote came from people who thought that take back control means finally we'll be able to get rid, not get rid of the Poles necessarily, get rid of the West Indians, the Indians, the Pakistanis, get rid of the you know, Ghana, Nigerian, etc., etc. In other words, a basic racist vote. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to say that, of course, but um, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think that's a, shall we say a third, it's a part of the Brexit uh, uh, constituency, even if it's not all of them. Um, I mean, the, about the schools, the truth is, I don't, I don't really know the way, uh, you know, imperial, the empire is taught in schools. I should imagine it's generally taught in a, you know, pretty, uh, if you like, self-critical way. And we have, you know, Black History Week and. <clears throat> You know, there, 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 all, there, all, there is, however, there is a kind of counter, counter push, a push back, in particular on debates like, you know, the Churchill and the Bengal famine. There's a, there's a kind of area where people, should we say, uh, pro-imperialists you know, will mount a defence of the British Empire as a kind of liberal paternalist project which may have made mistakes, but it was well meant. You know, the motives were altruistic. You will find that there is that kind of pushback. And you can see it in the recent biography of um, Andrew Roberts of Churchill too. Um, finally, your, <clears throat> your question about the procedure. Yeah, formally, the queen or the monarch in parliament is the sovereign body. Uh, there is no written constitution, it's often said. There are plenty of written <clears throat> written documents and acts of parliament signed by the monarch, so the, the, the queen and the king in parliament. Um, so in principle, yes, it was an advisory referendum which could have been set aside by an act of parliament. Parliament delegated their decision-making to the, the people, in inverted commas, the form of the president. They could they could have taken it back, or they could have ignored it. Um, of course, one has to think of the, the damage, the fallout that would um, create. <clears throat> um, the first uh, membership was negotiated by Labour Prime Minister Harold Wilson in 1972-74. Um, Britain came in on that basis of, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Edward Heath, the Conservative Prime Minister, negotiated it, um, 72 to 74. Um, both parties were divided. Harold Wilson uh, tried to play both sides, but basically wanted to stay in. He staged what he called renegotiations uh, in Brussels, and then he put the results of the renegotiations to a referendum. So that was the first Brexit referendum um, in 1975. Um, yeah, and if that answers your, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the legal question. Of course, the Brexit position is, yes, that referendum was uh, for membership of the common market, not for all the uh, changes or the extensions of Maastricht and so on that took place you know, since 
1975. That's their, if you want to call it a constitutional law, that's their position. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, final word on lawyers. If you're, if you're interested, one of our top lawyers has just been, is in the course of delivering a series of lectures in the BBC, yes. uh, Lord Sumption, uh, uh, and he's, a, he's strongly in favour of uh, Remain, but he's also strongly, strongly argues that um, you know, the question should never have been put um, in, the form, in, in a referendum. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I agree. You wanted to ask a question as well? I did, but... Uh, yes, please, so one hand is over here and one at the back. I thought you said the last question. Um, every country has links myths. I mean, whether it's Austria or Russia or France, but uh, I think the French were cleverer in terms of their colonial practices so that they still have this relationship, or am I completely wrong? It was British colonialism really so um, particularly racist, I would say, as opposed to others where there was more of the situation. <coughs> I'm not saying it was good. Oh, okay. um, you mentioned a lack of understanding of Northern Irish history. Um, I noticed there was an Irish woman included in the clip of the train, and I was wondering what your opinion is on um, wider Irish history history of Ireland as a whole, what the understanding of that is and how that had contributed to this myth-making about British Empire. Thank you. Um, I didn't recognise the Irish accent, I have to confess. Um, <laughs> uh, but I'll answer, I'll answer that, try and answer that question first. Um, <clears throat> well, it's a very difficult, as I said, really, it's a very difficult uh, question to to answer, but um, you know, high Irish family histories and British English families and Scottish family histories are so uh, intertwined. Uh, it's it's quite hard to um, you know to an to analyse them really. Uh, I mean, the fact is that the Northern Irish border is is a kind of accidental border in a sense. The way it was actually drawn up observed by Winston Churchill at the time, you know, was very haphazard and left uh, large amount numbers of, uh, of course, Irish, Ca Irish Catholics, uh, nationalists on the, quote, wrong side of the border. Um, and in that sense, the Irish, you know, Northern Ireland has, has, has not had a basic kind of democratic legitimacy for 50 years. It was a majority domination you know, in a sectarian system. Now that, after the troubles and after the violence, that was beginning to be, uh, shall we say, managed or even solved you know, for the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and Brexit now threatens to unravel that. And, um, and for conservatives like Boris Johnson to say that this is just a, you know, a minor issue, kind of sub, it's something that has been sort of created by the Irish almost, or used by the European Commission as an excuse. I think it just shows how, how um, you know, Anglo-centric their perspective on it is. Um, so that would be my response to the second. Um, what was the first question? I forgot. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, traditionally, the, the French have been uh, seen as uh, you know, more ready to export their culture, language, more egalitarian, you know, the principles of the French Revolution, allowing more assimilation, if you like, the kind of liberal imperialism of the early Victorians, as opposed to the more separatist you know, sounds of the late Victorians. I mean, the British Empire is also often said to have been based on divide and rule. Um, which, which kind of implies not getting involved and not intervening and, and not kind of recreating the, the colonial society, but somehow working with, or rather working with the traditional leadership. Um, I don't really think I, I could start um, trying to, you know, trying to make a comparative. 
comparison of the levels of racism in the British or, uh, and the French Empire, I think that would be <coughs> beyond my sphere of competence. I've probably gone too far beyond that already anyway. So. <laughs> I'm afraid we've run out of time. I would like to close here. We still invite you for a small reception with wine and snacks. Um, maybe we can discuss it more over wine. It will be a little bit better and a little bit more optimistic. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time and for coming here today. Uh, I would like to close this event with a big round of applause for our guests.